Hi everyone. Um, my name is Christine Rodriguez and I prefer to be called Christine by students. I call you by your first name, so I prefer to be called my, my first name. Um, this is just a brief overview to chapter one. Um, chapter one is the chapter in which you're introduced to the study of social problems. Um, and of course, one of the first questions that could be asked is, um, what is a social problem? Um, and um, if you ask someone walking along the street, that person will probably give you one answer. If you ask the next person, that person will probably give you another answer. Um, if you ask someone to name a social problem um, that you know, um, your best friend, your, your mother, your father, uh, your significant other, your coworker, etc. cetera. Um, if you ask most people, uh, what's a significant social problem or what's a social problem in your mind? Um, you would probably get various answers and not everyone would agree um, that the answer that another person gives is indeed uh, a social problem. Um, for example, um, a lot of people think that prostitution, the sale of sex, is a social problem. I personally don't think so. I uh, think that prostitution should be legal. I think it would make it safer for um, not only the prostitute, but also the client. Um, and of course, if it's legal, then people have to have business licenses and there would be um, establishments that uh, are where prostitutes would work from and people would go there. Uh, kind of like a, well, actually the way that it is done in the 11 um, counties in Nevada. Um, there are 11 counties where prostitution is legal, and that means that all, well, at least in theory, all prostitution occurs only in brothels, uh, which are legally sanctioned places where people go to purchase sex. Uh, so, again, not everybody would agree with me, obviously, and there are many, many people who would say that I am absolutely wrong, and that's fine. We can disagree on that. Um, so, we could use a generally accepted or typically used um, idea of social problem. Um, and that is the idea that it's a, an issue or a phenomenon that is regarded by a significant number of people as um, being a problem or uh, an issue or um, something that is bad um, that should not happen, something that needs to be addressed. Um, however, there's an issue with this because the problem is that, <coughs> excuse me, um, who's deciding what the significant number is? What's the magic number? Um, now, if I'm, I'm the one deciding whether or not prostitution is a social problem, then I would say it's not a significant number. <coughs> excuse me. Hold on. I'm sorry about that. Uh, on the other hand, if a priest is deciding, then the priest would, or a rabbi, or a minister, or, or an, an imam, or you know some other religious in, uh, person, that person would probably say, "Well, absolutely, prostitution is illegal," and there are a significant number of people who say that it is. And so again, we have an issue of well, who who is deciding what what. A significant number is who's deciding what the magic number is before we decide to address something. Um, also, um, <clears throat> we should keep in mind that um, there is something called ethnocentrism, um, but there's also another, what I think is a cool and groovy sociological concept called um, cultural relativism. And there is a discussion uh, in the first chapter about uh, ethnocentrism. Um, but I want to really focus on it here because I think it's really important for us to recognize how quickly or easily uh, we engage in ethnocentrism, that is, we think in a very ethnocentric way, when we are uh, analyzing something uh, that is not, or interpreting something that is not common or known to us. Um, so, for example, I want you to consider that um, there are many people who would say that uh, something such as um, spanking, spanking uh, a child as a form of physical punishment. Um, there are many people who would probably say, uh, well, 
you know, all the child rearing experts say <clears throat> that um, it isn't, um, and so therefore uh, people shouldn't use um, spanking as punishment uh, for their children. Um, well, that mode of thinking is very much a westernized view of child rearing. Um, this notion that you should not spank a child, um, that other forms of punishment uh, could be used, things such as timeouts and um, you know, taking their favorite toy away, etc. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in many places in the world, um, spanking a child is still considered a very um, acceptable form of punishment. And uh, we might negatively judge people who spank their children, um, but we, we're not rearing their children. Um, you know, there are maybe some children who are so stubborn or necio necia, as we say in Spanish, who just really don't pay attention unless you, unless you spank them. Um, I've never had any children, so I've never had to face this issue. Um, but maybe some of you do, or, um, you will, um, or you plan to, uh, someday have children and you'll have to face this, this notion of whether or not to use spanking. Um, cultural relativism, on the other hand, is something that is really uh, unique, um, but it is, of course, more difficult. Um, I don't, I don't, it's not actually difficult. It just takes more time. It means that you really have to stop and think, and you have to um, slow down and not make such quick negative judgments about other cultures. Um, you really have to try to understand another culture, not based on your own culture, because that's what we typically do. That's ethnocentrism. But trying to understand another culture based upon that culture's perspective, not your perspective. It's almost um, akin or the same as that old idea about not judging a book by its cover or not judging a person until you've walked a mile in their shoes. And so um, it does take more effort. Uh, as I said, it means we have to slow down. It means we have to really try to understand um, the other culture's perspective. Um, and so, you know, for example, if we think about um, something such as uh, suicides. Suicide in Japan um, has a very long tradition and um, in fact, uh, people may commit suicide when they have experienced a great deal of shame or someone else has caused them a great deal of shame. Um, it is also uh, the case that sometimes people uh, consider a noble act when they commit suicide because they're doing something, uh, they're committing suicide for something greater than themselves. So you could think about the samurai warriors uh, in ancient China who uh, committed suicide. They stuck their swords in their stomach and twisted them so that they could die um, rather than being captured, which, you know, would be shameful. And so taking your own life was something that uh, was considered noble. Also during World War II, there were kamikaze pilots. It was, that's what they were called in the U.S. I'm not sure what the Japanese called them, but um, these were pilots who knew. They volunteered to fly their planes into enemy targets. And they knew they were going to die, um, and yet they believed that this was a noble act because they were doing something for their country or a cause greater than themselves. Um, and in Japan today, even, there are places where it is known um, that people go to commit suicide. Um, if it's a forest, um, there are some forests in Japan, and these are known as suicide forests. Um, in fact, a, a, a fairly well-known uh, blogger or uh, be vlogger, um, oh, I think it was a year or so ago, um, he was in Japan and he, he took a video of himself walking through the forest and he came upon someone who was hanging from a, a tree, um, this person had committed suicide, um, and he, you know, said some stupid things about it and he posted it to his uh, website or on YouTube and uh, he got a lot of, got a lot of shit for it, got a lot of flack for it. Um, so he apologized and he took it down. So, um, you know, that's the kind of ethnocentrism that we want to avoid. Uh, judging other cultures, just because we're trying to understand other cultures, though, does not mean that we uh, have to agree with them. 
I'm not suggesting that, um, but trying to understand why people might do the things that they do differently from ourselves. Um, but I do want to um, make sure that I, I, I say this because I don't want you to m misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that we should never uh, judge in a negative way a cultural practice or ritual or tradition. Um, I'm not suggesting that. I, I do believe that there are some times when as a global or a um, human community, we do need to stand up uh, and say, we cannot, we will not let this happen. Um, and I, just off the top of my head, I would say the three things that I can think of are uh, genocide of any type, um, female circumcision, and um, honor killings, honor maimings, honor disfigurings. Um, and I'll, I'll let you look up um, female genital mutilation on your own. That would take me quite a while to go through. Um, but I'm just going to use very simply um, genocide. Um, and there are three questions that over the years I have developed for myself to ask um, when I'm trying to decide whether to use cultural relativism or whether to um, judge in a negative way. It's okay to judge in a negative way, some cultural practice, tradition, or ritual. Um, and so here are the three questions that I ask when I'm thinking about whether or not to use cultural relativism. Um, I ask, is it involuntary? Um, is what's happening to people, is it something that is involuntary? Is it something that is being forced upon them? Is it something they don't have a choice about? If the answer is yes, then that's a red flag. Uh, I also ask the question is, uh, the question, is the practice, the behavior, the tradition, the ritual, is it oppressive? Um, that is, are people in that country or people to whom it is happening, um, is the, is the tradition of the ritual or the uh, action so harmful to them that they are in, they live in fear, that they, they're intimidated, that they may not be able to live openly um, uh, as the individuals that they are? Um, and if the answer is yes, and again, another red flag. Um, and then finally, I ask the question, is the behavior, the tradition, the ritual, et cetera, is it inhumane? You know, is this something that I wouldn't even want my dog or my cat um, to experience? Um, and if the answer is yes, then again, I say, well, that's a red flag. And so if the answer to one or more of these questions is yes, um, I'm much more likely then to be able to say, well, you know what, this is something that maybe I do need to speak out about. And so as I said, genocide to me meets all three criteria. Um, I don't think anybody, any group of people volunteers to be the target of genocide. Um, so, of course, it's involuntary. Um, it is also oppressive. Um, there have been many instances in which people have tried to hide their religion or their political affiliation or um, their sexual orientation, etc., because they are the targets of, of genocide. Um, so it is certainly oppressive. Um, and then third... I, I definitely believe that genocide is something that is inhumane. Um, I wouldn't want humans to just go around and start randomly killing animals, nor do I think it's a good idea or acceptable for humans to randomly kill um, others simply because they don't like their religion or their skin color or whatever it might be. So, um, you, you know, you might think, well, you know, I, I like those three criteria that Christine's come up with, and I think I'll use them too, I'll adopt them, or not. Um, but I do encourage you to try to use cultural relativism as we move through um, this um, course. And um, again, recognizing that, some t that there are limitations. There are limitations to cultural relativism. Sometimes we shouldn't use it. Okay, so enough about that. Um, so um, I also want to make sure that I, I introduce the idea of norms and values, because um, it's not a requirement that you have taken introductory sociology. Um, but in any sociology course, um, you will hear that these two terms, norms and values. And norms are socially shared ideas uh, about how we're supposed to behave, right? Um, they're 
you know, how the rules, the rules for how to live in a society. So rules for um, how to dress, how to walk, how to talk, um, what kind of religion to practice. You know, we have a lot of norms uh, in society and they're just really rules or expectations for proper behavior. And of course, these norms will vary uh, depending upon the country. Um, so one of the norms in the United States, for example, is when you go out to eat or you go um, get a cup of coffee or, you know, in any way, shape or form, you you buy something other than in a retail store. Um, a lot of di times to di now, uh, people expect a tip. Um, even if you get frozen yogurt, there's a little tip jar. OK, now, when I was growing up, that tipping for every little thing was not something people did. In fact, eat out all that often. Oops, laptop slipped. People didn't eat out all that often. Um, so you didn't have to tip. Um, no reason to tip. Um, today, though, um, it seems like tipping is expected by just about everybody. Okay? Um, and so when you go to a European country, or I was just in Australia this summer for a few weeks, um, it turned out that people don't normally tip, and that's okay. Um, and it kind of was nice to just know, okay, this is the price, and I don't even have to think about tipping. So those are norms. Values, on the other hand, are um, socially shared ideas about right and wrong. Okay, so the norms are expectations for proper behavior. The values are um, shared ideas about what's important, what's what's good, what's right. Um, and so as we move through, you'll be thinking about those things in terms of social problems. Um, and then, of course, there's a discussion about the three major um, theories that sociologists use to study social problems. And my personal Two favorites are the conflict theory, which is based on much of Karl Marx's writings, um, which really is focused on inequality in society and power and how power is used to create inequality. Um, and then, of course, there's critical constructionism, which is much more focused on the idea that laws um, and social problems are, are constructed by the people in power, so that social problems are socially constructed. Um, and the people who have the power they define social problems in such ways, such a way that what they do uh, is generally not viewed as a social problem, but what others do um, is viewed as a social problem. And then finally, symbolic interactionist. Um, symbolic interactionism is another perspective, which is a micro perspective. It's very focused on how we interact uh, with one another and how our actions um, may perhaps um, influence or are how we think about social problems. So um, that's it. Just a quick overview of chapter one. And um, I'll see you next week for an overview of chapter two. Bye.